Uh, my name's Andrew Stuck. I'm one of the co-producers of Soundwalk September. I want to thank, first of all, uh, all the presenters on this panel, uh, because they're all contributing their time and their expertise. And I want to especially thank um, Nigel Bristow, who has brought these panelists together and will chair the session. Now, Nigel himself has uh, made um, geolocated um, audio drama. Um, he uh, made a piece which actually took place on a couple of buses. So I'm not sure whether it was actually a sound walk or actually a, a sound bus ride, but it was geolocated using the Echoes app. And um, we'd like to uh, thank Echoes especially uh, because Echoes are sponsoring this panel event. Um, Echoes themselves specialize in geolocative audio. Their free and open access platform, uh, echoes.xyz, allows creators to make and publish incredible GPS-triggered walking experiences, including bus experiences. And, we, and they also design bespoke apps, which focus on sound and location, including working with the Royal Parks in London and the Royal Academy's um, uh, collaborative Music for Trees app. So a big thank you to Echoes. And now I'll pass you over to, to Nigel to introduce the panelists. Thanks, Andrew. Um, and thanks for the, uh, the perfect segue. Um, so yeah, I'm... Uh, I'm, I'm oh, what's that? Um, I'm quite a, a, a newbie to, to this exciting world. And um, I suppose one of the things that uh, chairing a panel allows me to do is to, is to invite a bunch of people who know it considerably better than I do and um, uh, have them uh, offer up their, um, their experience. So that's quite an exciting uh, thought. Um, so the, a little bit about the, the structure of what we're gonna um, have tonight. Um, we're gonna hear um, and see presentations from each of the, the panelists. Um, these are going to be very short, very focused. Um, there are going to be about six and a half minutes each. But um, as you, you know, if you do the maths, you'll work out that's going to be, you know, a sizable chunk. It's going to be about half of the the, uh, the session. Um, so th these are um, this is material uh, in, in itself. This is something which is covering the idea of the. The ground, you know, the, the idea of reculer pour mieux sauter means that you have to draw back in order to spring forward. And so this is kind of looking at, you know, the territory so far. After that, uh, there'll be um, some uh, some questions which the panelists will uh, uh, answer, and um, uh, they'll be sort of. Uh, creator focused, audience focused, and then technology focused, and then there'll be questions from the audience. So please, um, as Andrew said, do uh, if you think about a question, if you put it in the chat, then it'll be easier for us to to refer back to them. Um, so what I'd like to do is um, I'd like to start off with a presentation for, from a panelist who isn't able to be with us. Uh, so Ralph Hoyt uh, from a, a company called SatSynth. Um, has very kindly um, recorded his presentation, and he's also recorded um, his answers to the questions, so I can feed feed those back in. Um, and also, by way of a, a perfect segue, we have one panelist who can't be here. We have another panelist who's kind of here incognito, <laughs> is in the audience. So uh, Julian Rickart um, from uh, One Step at a Time, like this, uh, has incredibly gamely joined us at 4 a.m. in, is it Sydney time? Melbourne? Melbourne? Yeah. Uh, so uh, Julian is kind of, um, uh, he's amphibious. He's both a panelist and a, and a member of the audience. Um, so what I'll do is I'll paste in the link for um, Ralph's presentation. So thanks very much to Ralph Hoyt, who sadly is um, somewhere there isn't a GPS signal at the moment. Um, really, really interesting work. Um, 
So next up, um, we're going to have Duncan Speakman, um, who's going to uh, do his presentation uh, by sharing a screen with you. So Duncan, are you are you ready? Um, okay, I'm going to start my timer. So I'm Duncan Speakman. Um, I am also based in Bristol, uh, and I started with this kind of mobile locative stuff, actually with Ralph with the same team uh, in sort of early 2000s uh, with Mobile Bristol. And my initial, uh, my initial approach was a kind of response to mobile technology in the sense that I was getting worried that we had these tools starting to appear that were very good at connecting us to remote locations and distant places, but they also seemed to distance us from what was right next to us and in each other and our immediate surroundings. And so I've always kind of wanted to use these technologies in a way to force people to engage with where they are, to engage more directly with both the sort of social, physical, political environments that they're in. And so for a lot of this work, I made audio walks. Um, I'm kind of assuming that because you're in this talk, you know what I mean, walking around with headphones on, getting audio. I didn't make historical walks. Um, most of the time I was making work that was trying to just frame the everyday, um, trying to approach it in a sort of early 20th century documentary way where I'd write sad music and reflective text and people would be invited to kind of look at the world around them. And quite often I was trying to make the audience a performer. So rather than it just being about what's around them, it was also about them in the work. And the way I did this was quite often by um, sending out different audio soundtracks to different people who were walking at the same time. So they would get different instructions and they would kind of become performers for each other. So one of the things I started doing that I became known for was actually making mass participation walks, which I called subtle mobs. They were a, a sort of response to flash mobs because my worry with flash mobs was that more people watched them on YouTube than actually took part in them. So I wanted to make something that was so boring you would never watch a video of it online, but actually being part of it was really rich and rewarding. So I made these pieces that sometimes would have hundreds of people, um, sometimes thousands of people. Uh, I've lost one of them out. Oh, yes. um, and what would happen is we'd send out MP3s, half the audience would get one MP3, the other half the audience would get another MP3, and it would literally be a set of instructions to reenact everyday moments. And these would be sort of framed and described by a piece of music. Uh, I've also made smaller works that are just for two people. This is A Thousand Duets in Saitama, where two people at a time go out on a journey through a city, um, and each of them is getting a different set of instructions, so they appear at different places to each other. You might look up and see your partner walking along a balcony, or you might come and meet each other at certain points. I've also made works um, not for walking, like uh, Nigel's bus piece. This was a piece on a tram in Guangzhou, uh, where as the tram traveled along the Pearl River, you kind of heard almost a documentary soundtrack of the city you were seeing passing on the other side of the river. And when you put your hand against the glass, you would hear field recordings from the locations you were looking at. And, and for those sort of worried about these works being uh, niche or inaccessible, I think we had about 50,000 people did this over two and a half months or so. Um, it became a kind of thing to do in Guangzhou. But in all this work, that I, I think um, I, would, I would massively disagree with Ralph that it's not like making a film. Um, and that's because there's a world going on that's uncontrollable around you. And so the mantra I'm always working with is leaving space for the world to happen. That in the works I'm trying to make, I'm not just filling them with content and story and narrative, because what's going on around people is generally going to be more exciting than anything, anything I can write. So I'm trying to make ways of framing that and getting people to engage with it and to make the work try and have a dialogue with its environment, not just overlay it with new content. Um, the works that I've just talked about there are all site specific uh, in that they were designed for, actually that's not true, two of the works there are site specific. The subtle mobs and a number of other pieces I've made are actually what I would describe as site responsive. So they're not designed for a specific location, they're designed for a type of location. In that way they can be 
um, re-listened to in different environments. So one might be designed for train stations and it draws on the sort of specifics of train stations and the commonalities of train stations. More recently, I've been looking at how to make generative GPS works. Um, this is actually a piece called It Must Have Been Dark By Then, which is actually based on an experiment I did about 13 years ago with early GPS uh, systems, which is rather than creating a set of locations in advance that people are supposed to go to, it asks the audience to find types of place. So it asks them to find water or it asks them to find um, a building and then when you've chosen that place it creates a GPS marker that then stays there that you can walk back to and it triggers different different content and a lot of this work has led me to thinking about the relationship between audio walks and eco-critical work and so I've also been working with augmented audio systems where I have microphones on the outside of the headphones and these allow me to use the sound of the world around the audience. So it's not just cutting you off from the world, but it's actually picking up sound. So I might play you a field recording of a rising sea somewhere, and then it might process the sounds around you. So the cars and the people around you start sounding as if they're underwater. And a lot of this for me is about trying to create an entanglement and a kind of um, something that breaks down that human nature divide. And I think audio, has that potential because sound is a way of, as Anya Kangisa says, it makes it apparent that the world is not for humans, but the world is rather with humans. And that is my six minutes and 30 seconds. Thanks. So, uh, Fran, would you like to go next? I, um, my, my background is originally in sound. I trained as a classical musician and radio producer. Um, working for, for the BBC for a while. Um, but I then moved on to work in, in journalism uh, for quite a long time, working for The Guardian. Um, but at the same time, was really trying to explore um, my own kind of sound art practice. So doing a lot of experimental radio, experimenting in different forms. And then around um, 2010, started getting interested in how um, iPhones and phones with um, with location uh, knowledge, knowing where you are, um, could um, could interact with kind of documentary music sound related material. Um, so um, I had been interested in audio walks before that, and I'd been making a number of of linear pieces, and I was um, like, I'm sure all of us here. We're talking on the panel really in, influenced by Janet Cardiff, um, who very much understood um, how the relationship of sound and the physical work world can can work strongly together. Um, and um, I, I, I guess this is what my primary interest has been in kind of geolocated audio is is a little bit like Duncan was saying. Um, the way that our physical environment and our relationship with that physical environment can change um, by layering in sound. So uh, Janet Cardiff says, you know, if, if the sounds are manipulated and changed, then our perception of reality um, can be drastically affected. So I got very interested in how um, by putting in all different types of sounds, we could change um, our relationship with the environment around us. Um, I, the first piece I, I made was uh, based in Hackney, where, where I am now in London Fields. The background behind me is, is London Fields. Um, and um, I made a piece that was um, commissioned by the Arts Council called Hackney Here, which I'll play a little extract of um, in a moment. And, and then I set up a production company to make more of these um, located apps with a, a radio producer friend, uh, Lucy Greenwell. And we made um, we made a piece about um, drugs, um, rock and roll, and was it sex, drugs, and rock and roll in, in Soho for the National Trust. Um, we did um, as as King's Cross was becoming gentrified, we we made um, a, a sound walk around King's Cross, and um, with Rachel Lichtenstein, we um, we did a piece about Diamond Street, um, linking with the research that she'd done for her book. 
and with a, a radio friend, Benjamin Walker, um, made a project in New Jersey um, around Hurricane Sandy and a particular stretch that had been affected. Um, the pieces that I do are very, very heavily layered and immersive, you kind of swim in sound. So I start off layering uh, music down and then I put big binaural soundtracks in and then um, kind of more um, hi-fi in the kind of Murray Schaefer kind of uh, way of describing things very, very tightly recorded sounds on top of that. And so as you kind of walk in and out of these layers, uh, which which you know, I take pains to make sure that none of the none of the lines um, of, of layers are at the same place, you're kind of swimming in and out of these layers. Um, uh, and, you know, in, in some ways, that's very traditional kind of radio techniques, having your music beds and your atmos and your speech. Um, but in lots of ways, the radio techniques don't work. And um, just to kind of touch on some of the um, the uh, the references to kind of film techniques or not film techniques that, that Ralph and, and Duncan were talking about, I, I, I thought as a radio producer that I would be well equipped to make um, these pieces. But um, you know, the first interviews that I did, which did have a lot of scene setting and um, a lot of the techniques that we use in radio making were really, really inappropriate for this work because it was blatantly obvious what you were seeing and where you were. And actually, again, like Duncan was saying, that a lot had to be stripped out and that the, the, the location, the scene itself was a character and that what your job was, um, was to, to kind of quite sparsely um, interact and place layers on top of that space. So, um, so all of the, the speech material became um, much tighter um, and spoke, literally spoke to that environment. Um, and Lucy and I figured out a kind of language that, that really worked for us when we were making these pieces. Um, I'm going to play a, a tiny montage from the from the Hackney piece, which. Um, is, is again, it kind of shows the kind of style that I like to use um, in a lot of my sound work, which is uh, not scripted. I tend not to do scripted work, but also um, layering voices and sounds from a number of different places. So, you know, I, this montage includes um, a, a kind of ex drug dealer from one of the estates here who um, talks about the kind of gangs um, that were that. The, the different gangs that intersect in London fields, but also includes people like Ian Sinclair and um, other historians. I, I commissioned fiction writers, um, I, I com commissioned composers, um, poets to write pieces so that as you walk around the area, you get this kind of different layers, both historically, but also in terms of the different social layers that are in this area, but without being didactic and having to kind of script this all. So I'll play you this little montage. We are about to go on a journey. Sleep in your pocket and prepare yourself. Are you ready? Sinclair, I'm a writer and I've lived in this area. You walk me a little way and then move over to the left where that bench is. We'll sit down and I'll tell you a little bit about what I feel about this place and what it means to me. Don't come around here thinking you can just come bop in this park. Don't come to a man's park and invite. That's like an invitation for help. Pig throwing on London Fields, 1788. Secrets. Mr. Boy in the tower block. I think he was on the fourth floor when I was 13. If you're a gang member, get the guns in. All small guns, big guns. In Hackney, if you're caught out with a nine millimeter, you're slipping. <laughs> I think it might have been my first kiss. You'll notice that, like the ship of Theseus, my parts have been replaced so many times wood, stone, metal. I'm not sure I'm the same bench as I was when I started. Follow me this way. Okay, stop, wait, close your eyes, listen. So inviting in the bubbles, let the light in in the swimming is relaxing. So my body feels like fighting in the London fields. Leader. This 
splish it up and splash it up The agony mix and mash it up The tattoo and the stash it up Lins in her Um, So I'm, I think I'm probably running out of time But I'll just quickly um, skip through these slides So um, these were just some quotes that I got um, from, from various different um, sound experiences that I, I did over the years. So people talking about um, their body as an instrument, walking in and out of sound, stopping it and starting it again, um, and, and the, kind of, the kind of fluidity and kind of layers and boundaries kind of disappearing by using kind of sound as, as these layers in space. Um, I felt like I was the push and pause button. Um, I'm just going to just give a quick shout out to audioar.org, which is a website um, that a colleague of mine, Halsey Bagand, and I are, are, um, are building at the moment. And finally, to um, a location-based project that we've been building during the pandemic, where we, um, we used Halsey's um, platform, um, Roundware, to invite people to tell their own stories. Um, around the pandemic. So this is something that was not as, as heavily authored and crafted as all of the experiences that I mentioned earlier, but letting people um, kind of contrib contribute them their own stories all around the world during this time, but also inviting artists, journalists, um, musicians to be taking these recordings and then remixing them. So it's a really open plan, not only for people telling their stories, but also for artists using um, what looking for material and using um, looking for, for pieces around this time um, uh, to, to remix in different ways. Those are just some of the places that has, have featured our stories. And thank you. Thank you very much, Fran. That was fantastic. Boz, uh, are you ready? Boz Temple Morris? Yeah, OK, I, I'm, I'm just going to give a quick sort of I mean, I'm not really going to go, go a rundown of all, of all my work. I mean, I'm, a, I'm an audio drama. I'm a drama producer and a, and a producer of arts projects of, that use storytelling to create change in, in, in some way, usually. Um, and I, I just want to I just sort of picked out three or four kind of moments, really, over the years that um, came to mind as having something inherent in them that was useful. Um, in, in terms of different approaches and and um, thoughts about this subject. The first one is a theatrical one. My background is in theatre. I, I, I ran a theatre company that was known for very visual, very site-specific work. Um, and uh, yeah, throughout the 90s, mostly. And one of the projects that we did was in, was in total darkness. Um, so whereas most of it was thinking very much about place and time and location and how different experiences will be uh, created in, in, in inside a different space and time, which is the opposite of how theatre normally works, where you're trying to put this, most people are trying to put the same show into the same place at different times. Um, and so anyway, th this was called Theatre Dream. Imagine this, you're, you're, you're in a space, there's a curtain, there's a light on the curtain, low light, the, the, the lights go down just as the curtain comes up, but instead of the stage lights coming on, they go totally off. So it's pitch black. You can't see anything. Um, even if you sat there for half an hour, you would see nothing. Um, well, you obviously there for half an hour because you're, you're in a theatre. Anyway, so then someone comes on. They got wearing big boots, and they come to the middle of the stage, and they stop, and, and they say a line. Um, and then they walk up the aisle to the middle of the of the auditorium. Um, sorry, they were on the stage the first time. They're in the middle of the auditorium now, and they say another line. Then, uh, but now you've realised, hang on, this is black. I can't see a thing. This is strange. Then the actor goes to the back of the theatre, behind the back row of the audience, and takes a breath to speak, but the next line comes from the stage. And everyone goes, ah! Um, and th the reason I picked that is that... Well, two things, actually. One is that it's about the, the nature of magic, actually, which I think a lot of of storytelling uh, in a locative sense for me is about. And what it's telling me about magic is that you can fool somebody whilst knowing exactly how you were fooled. It's not the fact you don't know that makes it incredible. It's just the fact that it happened. It's a bit like being in a train at a station and the train next to you leaves and for a minute you think you're moving and, and you feel it you feel the shake but then you realize oh no no hang on i didn't it's that train it's not this one and 
you have to reinterpret what what just happened. Um, I think that is 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 a really important thing to bear in mind in terms of how storytelling works in this context. And the other thing that it's doing, and this is p possibly more important, and and th this goes back to what Fran and Duncan have already said, is is that we, the maker, don't do all the work. You know what happened in that theatre was you suddenly realise, oh, okay, the boots and the voice are separate, and but what's happening is the scene comes together in your head as an audience member. So we, the maker, never do all the work because then you, as the audience, have got nothing to do. So the piece, the magic, comes together in the minds of the audience rather than being made in our desks and timelines and whatnot. This is taken further a bit later as I, we, I start doing walks and um, theatrical events that are live and uh, audio walks. And one of them in particular was a called Don't Feed the Pigeons, was a, was a full kind of experiment in psychogeography in the sense that it was trying to look at not just the effect of the place on the people, but the effect of the people on the place as well. And, and in this one, audience members turned up in Trafalgar Square and they're given an object and they're given a, a tape, an old school Walkman, because it's the, the partner in that project is Lomo Camera, so everything's done analog in that project. Uh, everything's recorded on tape, uh, as little email as possible. I think there was no email actually. And then um, all any meetings that took place in Trafalgar Square, uh, but anyway, eventually you put this headphone on and you walk um, and the drama starts and you're in the middle of this story and you've got this stuff and you're and you're there as the subject of the story and you're going to you have to meet somebody and, 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 and there's this voice in your ear. And they, but as you walk through Trafalgar Square, because we've got the audience member in exactly the same place as we've recorded, it means that we're able to have the fountain on the left and the traffic on the right in both reality and in the drama which means that if anything happens, either in reality or in the drama, it's often not clear in which of those places this, this thing happened. So there's a little crash, you turn around, is it, is it actually a crash on the road or was it in the story? So again, what we're doing is using that, that locative element of the drama to do exactly what Duncan was, was, was talking about and Fran alluded to, which is the, 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 that we don't do everything. You, you, you create, you put the elements together you, you assume what the specificity of that location and that space is going to be, and then you allow it to come together in the heads of the audience. Um, that's the second moment. Um, the, so then, yeah, we go on to make, use drama, use dramatic storytelling. Um, in the, in, so in the case of, for example, we made guides for various institutions like Strawberry Hill, where where we're recording binaurally and it's Horace Walpole whose house it is who's actually giving you the tour and there's stuff happening around. It's the, exactly the same principle of a drama that's playing out in the space and a drama that's playing out in, in your ears that's made. Um, and similarly, a, a uh, you know, a project for Detour, the app, um, which is all sort of geo focused. But the other thing I wanted to mention briefly, because I'm probably going to run out of time, is various ways that that over the years then we've tried to bring this to a mass audience. Um, sorry, that's my six and a half minutes. So can I maybe have 30 seconds? Um, how, how to bring this to, to a mass audience and, and there are probably five or six projects we've done at the BBC where we've tried to get them to take risks and to experiment in order to bring these principles, uh, to be able to play these principles in a way that, that, that can work for the kind of audiences that you get for one of those dramas, which is around a million people. Um, so some of that is is uh, recording in one take. Some of that is is recording uh, mixing uh, found footage with uh, the story uh, completely, so that it's an imperceptible which is which. And in the case of one long uh, scale project, actually, I've done a lot of work in relation to uh, Syria and Damascus, and 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 that is where we where we where we're essentially recreating a space that is inaccessible because it's being torn apart by war, working with people from that place in order to remake it. And in this case, it was as a fictional uh, space, a fictional place made like a soap opera. Um, and uh, that that uh, what we're essentially doing is, is, is using 
lots and lots of different techniques to recreate that space, to use all of the same principles in, in order to create a space that we can't access, in order that we can bring an audience into that space in, in, in an authentic way. Um, anyway, but I run out of time to tell you much about that. Thanks very much, Boz. We can uh, we can uh, unpack some of that um, in the uh, panel discussion. Um, and the last person uh, to present uh, is going to be David Merlo. Uh, yeah, um, my name is Dave Merlo. I'm here to talk to you about Forest Talk Radio. It's uh, uh, it's an app that has some uh, GPS triggered story walks embedded inside of them. I use the CGO map platform to create these walks. Um, and I guess if, if I'm trying to do in these, I guess I'm trying to explore the collisions between the world of technology and the world of nature. So I set these in forests and of course you're holding a cell phone. Um, and I guess I try to make sense of the seemingly different worlds and perhaps try to find a way to be able to reconcile them. So I guess you could say in a way I'm sort of asking what does it mean um, or how can I use technology to be able to enhance um, the relationship that we have with nature. And so if everyone can see this here, this is uh, one of my first little panel. Um, yeah, so I sort of came to thinking about all this stuff through um, through some graduate work uh, in philosophy and biology. Um, and I've also been a journalist and a uh, radio broadcaster. Um, but I think what was most profound um, on me as an artist has been my time as a good old-fashioned oral storyteller. Um, so I would tell traditional folk tales from my area. I would travel around um, Canada, the U.S. to different festivals, and um, yeah, and basically try to share my um, the experience that the characters that I have um, in our, I guess our doc, you know, like our our, our doctrine of, of folklore here in Northern Ontario. Um, but I've also talked to a lot of um, different storytellers, a lot of really good ones, and there's sort of this consensus that sort of surfaces that uh, our task as storytellers is not to help our audiences relate to our character so much as it is to um, to help our audience relate to our character as they are relating to their environment. Um, so good stories are by nature locative. Um, and I guess another way to put it is to have our listener inhabit this the territory of the story. Um, so Forest Talk Radio comes about, I ask this question, I say, well, how do I have my listener relate to my characters in such a way that my listeners will come to inhabit a forest in a more profound way? And, and what exactly would that mean? Um, and so I use forest science um, to really, really dig into this, particularly this idea of the wood wide web. Uh, raise of hands, who has heard of the wood wide web? A few people out there. Well, the Wood Wide Web, I guess it's that's what it's um, called in sort of a pop culture version, but it's a mycelial uh, web. It's uh, a mycorrhizal fungus that lines the forest floor. And actually, in established forests, it connects trees together. It, it offers them a wide variety of different support. Um, it allows them to sort of act more as a collective than it does to uh, for them to act as, as individuals. Um, but it also serves as a social network for trees, which I think is really kind of interesting. And so I've asked myself, well, what would this sound like? What exactly would, would this sound like? Um, yeah, and so with Forest Talk Radio Laurier Woods, um, so this is in uh, a conservation area here in northern Ontario, um, and it is considered, I guess, in, in Duncan's assessment of things, uh, very site-specific. And um, yeah, so you get on to the site, you turn on the app, you plug in your earphones, whatever, and you hear this radio show as you walk through, and you come to realize that uh, what you're really listening to is this is this mycelial web. It is this fungus who's this radio host, basically. And um, the and what you're hearing is the trees who are calling in to tell their story about their experiences of being in this forest. Um, so I, I just want to bring you to this particular photo right here. And so, of course, part of my task is to think artistically about what types of characters these two 
not two trees. And we have Antankerous uh, 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 cherry tree here. And we also have this very smooth talking maple over here. Now, um, from a biological perspective, the maple is uh, better positioned, I guess you could say, to flourish in a forest over the cherry um, because it has what's called a sapling bank instead of a... Um, instead of a seed bank. And so here are uh, these two characters uh, talking uh, talking about this. You've set up shop in my living room. Your roots are all up in mine, buddy. And your minions, your minions. Oh, I know they're out there. I can feel them. They're in position, moving in. I all but hear the war drums. Isn't my fault my kind is better equipped to take over the world. But at what cost? Your true colors are showing. I'm on to you. Who? Little old me, I mean, sure, my minion. The opportunity to really take off. You mean attack? It isn't my fault yours don't actually take root. Your youngins just sit there, dum de dum de dum twiddling their embryonic roots. Fine. I give up. I'm just not going to talk anymore. Oh. Don't be that way. Not talking anymore. Oh, come on. I didn't mean it. You don't really have a subpar seed. Not talking anymore. I'm only joking. Not talking anymore. Can't we just do the neighborly thing and nope. maybe... Not going to do it. Nope, not talking. So the rub of that story, of course, is that, uh, or that interaction, that dialogue, is that uh, these two trees are stuck to each other. They are interwoven and uh, they don't move. Um, and so they have to find a way to, to get along and, and, and deal with each other. Um, but the mycelia web is, 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 is really cool. Um, and there's an awful lot of science about it, and they've just touched on the surface about what it actually does. It's electrical signals, and uh, they're not exactly sure why and what that's all about. But... Um, yeah, so what I did was I, I played with this idea that, you know, I dropped my cell phone and it broke the back off and the circuitry was exposed and this fungal network decided to sort of integrate itself into the circuit board um, in an effort to actually have us be able to understand more about what is going on in an ecosystem, right? So it's like nature actually actively trying to communicate with us. And um, so I explored this a little deeper in Forest Talk Radio Old Growth Tomogamy. Now, Tomogamy is an area in Northern Ontario. It is, uh, it is, it's considered deep wilderness. It's, it's really, really vast. This is from a fire tower that's, uh, that's up there um, that actually has a role in the, in the, the radio drama itself. Um, so basically, the uh, <laughs> old growth, um, you get on to, to, the, to the site and you turn on your, uh, your app and then you find yourself that you've awoken into a world where you're this brainless automaton. Um, so it's in the second person and uh, your mission more or less is to figure out what's going on. Um, so you have these moments of clarity where uh, uh, there's a radio host who's broadcasting, and but only intermittently. And so for some reason, the radio waves are sort of like uh, interfering with what's making you this brainless automaton. Um, and while you have this moment of clarity, um, you start to piece things together and start to figure things out. And you actually learn that what has happened is that trees have commandeered their mycelial web to basically hack into our cell phone grid um, to implant this, I guess you could say, this like this digital virus that leaps over the silicon uh, divide through your cell phone and into your brain and sort of puts you at the service of the forest. Um, and this is all in an effort to get you as a human to be able to relate to what a tree feels like when it's being cut down. And so you, as you walk through this, which incidentally, this walk is type specific. It's, um, as Duncan was saying, it's not necessarily site specific. So you can listen to it anytime. Um, and in fact, uh, I encourage you to do so because it's an awful lot of fun. Um, go ahead and sit under your favorite tree. Um, but what for me, I think, oh yeah, I want to play you this little, this little clip. So this is you. Um, the, so the radio has sort of broken in and it's pulled you out of being this brainless automaton and uh, the radio signal is fading and this is you going back in to becoming this, uh, this uh, so-called sleepwalker. You shake your head in disbelief, partly because you are struggling to decipher what is real at this point in time. And partly because 
because you manage to willfully shake your head. But the signal fades into static on the radio. You go to switch it off. And once again, you feel the control of your body fade away, your limbs, your vision gone. And the last to go offline is your hearing. That left-right shuffle on the ground below, your now automated feet. Your last thought before your consciousness goes offline is that you forgot to tie up your boots. So as I said, you can listen to this from anywhere. And in fact, you can go online to forestalkradio.ca and uh, listen to the online version of it. Um, but there was a certain um, charm, I guess, setting it inside of this old growth forest. wilderness like you're in there i mean the trails are you know they're not super difficult but um uh, they are to to a certain extent um but um like this is an old very well established forest and it like it weighs heavy on you when you're inside it you know it's like and you are inside it right like it fully fully takes you in um and so this is sort of my way at uh at having finding a way to to commandeer the perceptions that you're having of the forest and sort of fold that back into the narrative that I'm trying to tell. And so I guess you could say it's like some my version of enhancing reality um, through cell phone technology, but where nature's doing the heavy lifting and uh, and not the technology. That's about what I got. Uh, Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Um, okay. So uh, we've had... Um, Fantastic presentations from all our panelists. Um, we've expanded a little bit um, beyond uh, the, the length of time I was sort of hoping for. So um, we're going to have to focus uh, some of this discussion so that we've got time for questions. What I'd be interested in, in hearing, I'd like to start um, maybe uh, not the most obvious place. So rather than starting with questions about uh, what I call creative focused questions, maybe I'd we start with audience focused questions so um in some of the presentations we've heard uh, who the audience were so for instance ralph's talks about um uh educational stuff so uh school kids being some of his audience or heritage work etc um but i just wondered what um what the panelists thought about is is the audience for this kind of work changing is the composition of the audience um and in what ways and and how would how would each of us like the audience to change so if any of the panelists have got any panelists or uh julian rickard um the man who's staying awake uh has have anything they'd like to uh to, to talk uh like to say to talk about that question I could say that one of the questions that's often asked me about audiences is whether the work is going to be available not on site. And I guess this is around work that is site specific. But I, you know, I, and I think that different people have got different opinions about how important it is to listen to stuff on site or to make it, you know, kind of available offline. But um, there is, there has been this tension about kind of metrics and numbers, and um, you know, if you only limit it to be able, being able to hear it on site, then it then it does limit your audiences. And, and and certainly when you're trying to make you know get grants, get people to pay you for this kind of stuff, it, it's it's it can be problematic. But I know that a lot of people like myself are very very resistant about making that. Make it, making work not not available um, to, to people who are who aren't on site. So I, I guess that's one one of the things that comes up over and over again for me, at least with audiences. Okay, Duncan. Duncan's got something to speak to that. Okay, um, I totally agree with Fran. The the uh, the frustration about people going, oh, can we listen to this at home? And you're kind of like, no, the whole point of the work is how it engages with the site. But I think the question about Metrics, though, is, you know, we, we have great sculptural works, you know, great public artworks that, that thousands and millions of people go and see. And um, sometimes I think it's just a, it's a tension around the ephemerality of it. Uh, people are like, well, wh where's the actual thing that people can go and look at? Because actually you could still have the same accessibility to it. Um, 
if you look at the the audio walk at Stonehenge, you know the amount of people that have listened to that. It's I hope no one here made it. it I think it's terrible. Um, but, <laughs> but, but a lot of people have listened to that. You know, it's, it's an, you know because it's there and it's on a site. So in a way, it's just it's just about venues and sites making things more accessible i, I think partly i and also um duncan also that the um the references feel wrong to me like the idea that these are being referenced towards kind of mass media so you're saying like compare it to this like youtube video well that's not the right reference and i think because a lot of this work is digital you can compare it with an mp3 that you can you know a music mp3 that's that's can be distributed or a video that's on youtube that therefore those are the comparisons whereas like you're saying duncan it's like well you wouldn't like going to a museum site specific but no one has problems about those numbers um, yeah maybe i, I could I, sorry sorry i, I was i was just going to add to your to your question that that i think there is an interesting thing happening which is about age and and with it it's about appetite for different ways of telling stories. You know, the audio is has been a very old, an older person's medium. You know, you look at the who listens to sort of traditional drama or who gets an audio walk, uh, an, a, 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 what do you call it, a device when they go to a museum. Um, and that obviously we've seen that get a whole lot younger with with podcasting and 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 with and with slightly more experimental and interesting approaches, um, which kind of tends to go help with the, the age thing, because the, what, what the, the real point about the age thing is 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 to do with trying to decouple some of these forms from the traditions that people, including the sort of clients who pay for them, might come to expect. You know, so how do we kick the doors open on some of this? stuff which will engage a whole lot of other people and what we're seeing is a massive expansion in general of who's involving themselves and 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 consuming uh audio and and that's bringing in new age groups and and hopefully with it new uh experimentation in form and and as the tech improves as well like now you can stream stuff people aren't so scared to be fiddling around on their phones as they were like i just think People are now not scared to to listen to podcasts because it doesn't seem like techy and confusing. And so, I, I I think that I think the demographics are going to change as it it does actually become easier, and also because as the the audience becomes younger as well, as Boz is saying. A couple of things I'd like to pick up on um, from that. One is the the um, I don't know. Maybe you could say there are three kinds of um, uh, classification where you have site specific um, and then you have what Duncan was talking about with his site responsive work where um, it must have been dark by then um, can be can be listened to anywhere but it, 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 it has a set of coordinates which the um, well you can explain it more, more succinctly than I can Duncan and then I suppose the third one is this idea quite of quite loosely, and there's probably an academic somewhere who would be getting really upset about the way I'm saying site responsive. Um, but but yeah, that's what you said is about that it's that it's something that can be placed anywhere, but it ha it 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 adapts or changes or or is open to what's happening in in that new place. I guess that's that's the way I would. Define. Okay, so that um, so there are those two classifications, and the third one is just. Ah, and it could have an armchair um, uh, standalone listening, and that's what uh, both you and, and uh, Fran balked at. Um, the other thing I'd like to just pick up on, and I'm suddenly speak much faster, but because um, I'm, I'm aware that uh, there's lots of interesting stuff to cover, um, is the degree to which the audience are perhaps co-authors or um, Again, Duncan, you were talking about co-opting them into becoming performers, and I guess that's something that um, Julian's work has also done quite a lot. So maybe we could talk about whether the audience's appetite for that kind of work has has increased, maybe due to other kinds of um, immersive theatre performances. Uh, I, ha I have no idea what, what an audience's appetite in the future might be. Only that I, I agree with a lot of 
with a lot of what people have been saying, this thing about leaving space um, for, for the audience. Uh, I talk about it in terms of a, of a stick. If you hold both ends, you can't throw the stick. So you let go of one end and then you can, uh, can use it. We're, we're currently creating a, a work, uh, a sound work, but then the audience arrive at certain places where there's a, uh, an AR component, a visual component. And uh, I, I always find it a little bit of a fall when we're controlling both the audio and the visual. I like it when there's just the, just the single one because it leaves people free. Duncan? Um, yeah, I also don't really like thinking or knowing about the sort of audience um, in that in that way. I I mean, it it might sound weirdly pretentious, but I sort of feel like I'm I'm just making the work like and and I and at some I've been making the same work for you know 15, 16 years, and I'm going to keep doing that, and the audiences will change and come, and how that's marketed and and where it becomes popular, I'm sort of going to leave to. The venues and the and the promoters and the marketing teams because I, that's not what I want to spend my time thinking about. I'm just trying to make the best work I can. And no, it's ne no one's it's it's not that everyone's going to like it. It's never going to be the case. So I'm not sort of pushing towards that. So it's very hard for me to think about asking questions about what when is it going to become popular or how is it going to become popular. What audiences taste things like that. Yeah, so it's a tough one, I think. Before we talk about um, you know one platform versus another, um, so I guess again maybe this is an oversimplification, but there are the people who probably are the the kind of the unity people, people who like to build things in in an engine like that, uh, and Satsymph uh, seem to be working uh, in that sort of area, and I guess Duncan, some of your works probably. Uh, driven or, or, or constructed like that. And then there are people who are, I guess, interested in plugging and playing, basically having a the simplest form of technology to deliver um, to deliver the uh, the piece. So um, fewer variables, fewer bells and whistles, and um, basically somebody else has done the heavy lifting for them. Um, do you think the platforms and the apps influence the shape of the work that's being made? And what what developments would facilitate better work or better user experiences? Um, Boz, I was quite interested, Boz was going back to the um, the dark ages of, uh, of analog tape. You're talking about a Walkman yeah. piece. And I remember, Fran, from one of your presentations, you talked about the fact that it's basically the eureka moment was the fact that your phone had a GPS and you could suddenly see how you could locate things. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, the medium transformed, that you know, the medium was the message that, that the, app, the app transformed what you could do. I mean, the, the storytelling has got to, I mean, for me, I, I don't, I, I'm not really, I mean, the, the storytelling is the thing and that I'm not, so for, I'm, I wouldn't be doctrinal about more bells and whistles equals better storytelling. You know, any more than a thicker paper equals a better book. Um, but um, you know, so I, I suppose that's the sort of benchmark. Any any new piece of technology. So, for example, with the thing that we made in the Detour, it was pretty soon after you were able to trigger geo uh, to geolocate a trigger to a relatively small space. And so, what that that's great bit of ability and and what that does is that it simply it introduces the ability for a to, to to use that in 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 your storytelling to trigger something to a particular site to a smaller space but had, had we not had that um that wouldn't necessarily make a better story but it would make a different one so i mean I suppose it comes back to, to the sort of site specific thing that it that, that once the if the story's driving it then then the the, the the technology will be used um in the right way um, I, I, I kind of agree with Boz, but I kind of don't as well, because um, I've heard a lot of people who come from 
content background saying like the story has to drive everything like I worked in VR for years and lots of people said that as well and it's true there's like lots of tech projects with awful stories and awful storytelling but I also having worked across quite a lot of different types of um, platforms so AR, VR, AI now they each seems to afford very different types of possibilities and in story and need very different approaches and so I think that for me it's kind of equal like like medium and message are kind of equal players and you're all the time just trying to figure out how that that relationship between them what that is in in my mind rather than you know of, often when I was working at the Guardian we were talking about VR stories it was always well you need you know you need good journalism and you need a good story before you can start that's certainly true but then trying to kind of often shoehorn that into a platform afterwards can be really problematic so I feel like it's like this dance permanent dance between the two sorry Oz. <laughs> Uh, no, Duncan. not at all. Right. Duncan, you were, you were had um, your hand. Yeah, up. I, I feel like I'm like Franz Hyper here. Uh, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I agree with that definitely. It's, there's there's a dance between the two. There is, yeah, a, a, a thicker piece of paper doesn't make a better story, but the ability to write the story down on a piece of paper, the sort of the fact that paper exists, does does make a, a really big difference. And for me, at the moment, working with um, augmented audio, the sort of systems that I'm I'm now can work with where I can process the sound in real time portably um, that that allows a totally different type of work that I've never been at well it's not new I, I was doing it 10 years ago it's just like it's smaller now but when I could start doing that it does allow a thing that was just never possible in terms of the narratives I'm creating and the narratives aren't words I think that's an important thing in, in what I'm doing that that the narrative and the story structures are created through the different ways I can sort of man manipulate um, sound. So I think I think the platform thing. I've I've got a very small rant on that. There's for me there's two approaches to plat platforms. There's the if you want to just do it at home on your own and try stuff out and throw ideas together. There's loads of really great sort of you know you just do it yourself platforms like Echoes. Um, uh, uh, well, no detours gone now, but there are other ones floating around, and those are the ones where they exist. You can put l located stories, and the technology doesn't affect the story. You can write better and better stories. But we have this sort of assumption sometimes that we're always people are constantly saying to me, "Oh, how can we make this platform suitable for you?" And I'm just like, I don't, I don't want a platform that suits me. I want the collaborator who can work with the tech because I work with the sound and the story, and the and I don't want to have to sort of find a technology that that can do that that I have to work within those limits of like like Fran was saying I just want to find the right collaborators to work with them I just think we shouldn't always assume that this is a solo endeavor where locative audio walks are just written by writers and playwrights they're a team effort whether that's musicians writers but also the people actually making the technologies that facilitate it so find good people to work with because there's loads of people out there who can just knock that stuff up in five minutes and you might have some crazy idea that isn't on echoes or Dieter or whatever and they can just make it for you rather than you going oh I'll change my story that's my rant sorry that's done. and a very good rant it was too I think I should just mention uh, CGO map as, a, as another uh, platform because <laughs> we've got uh, some of those folk in the in the room what I'd like to to do to conclude is to ask people ask the panel really uh, and Julian um, if um, what what you if, if you could come up with one important question which we should be thinking about you don't need to have an important answer uh, in relation to the future of uh, uh, locative uh, audio drama uh, Dave uh, you've been quiet uh, out there in the woods. Well, I tried to get in on the last question, but I guess I didn't. Uh, Sorry, I didn't see your hand. Use my hand yes. correctly. Sorry, Dave. No, that's okay. Although, do you mind if I talk about CGO Map a bit? I think I'll, I'll just be very brief. Yeah, I, okay. I mean, it's a pretty cool platform, um, but it also has its limitations. And like, I'm used to, um, yeah, like engaging with an audience, right? Like, there's no fourth wall in in oral storytelling when you're getting up there there in your brain. Um, so you're engaging directly with your audience. And uh, to have sort of this technological 
mediation that happens, um, it becomes quite troublesome um, at times, at least at the beginning it really did. And um, when I came to Fred Adams and CGO Map platform, I started to really feel how the limitations of the technology were really like influencing my storytelling. And at first I thought it was to a detriment, um, but then eventually I figured out that no, these limitations are actually, I mean, the major limitation is that because it's a web app, it's not a native app, um, it works um, via cell service, you, uses data and the like, um, that you're limited to three minutes per entry. And so it's a challenge to, to tell a story where you have to, you know, where you're limited by that, uh, by a time frame like that. Um, but I think if there's anything that has conditioned my storytelling, um, um, it is the actual because uh, oddly enough, both of my story walks and the ones that I have in the future, they are loops. And so it gets really challenging to tell, like they're lassos, right? They're, they start off with this little tail and then there's this little loop. Um, and so you come back down places that you've already listened to. Um, but what's nice about working with CGO Map is that it does feel like more of a collaboration in the sense that I, uh, my needs, um, technologically speaking, um, like they they are working on them. They are working on ways to be able to disable the audio if you're going back over a particular location, right? Like they're very willing and accommodating to work with me, the artist, to to find solutions and find ways to be able to, um, um, yeah, to tell the story. I guess that 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 I want that I want to tell. Um, but the main challenge with the whole loop uh, lasso thing is that um, I'm taking a, a linear story and, and I'm trying to tell it in sort of cyclical fashion, right? So it's like you come back, um, yeah, once the climax of the story has happened, you you still have more of the story to figure out. And so there was an awful challenge with that. Um, and that's something that I don't think the technology can ever figure out. Um, it is just a way that the, the story is told. Okay, cool. That's a good plug for CGO Map as well, uh, as uh, <laughs> an illustration of the uh, phenomenon of um, uh, tech or uh, uh, tech following, yeah, responding to the problems of the creators of the creators rising to the challenge of the tech. Um, we're going to have to draw it to a close. Uh, I know Duncan has definitely got to get away before he turns into a pumpkin. Uh, Babek had a great question, uh, and I'll just float that out there. Whether any of the panelists has a crazy off the wall idea for a locative audio project that would be so cool but currently not yet realizable. I, I want to do things that are slightly more context sensitive than is potentially possible. Um, partly because I'm sort of also wary about data mining and, and things like that. Um, I'm, I'm interested I have a tension because I really like to author heavily, partly because I'm a composer, so I, I like to really have a lot of control over the structure. But I am interested in some of the possibilities that, I mean, Fran might know more about this in terms of where kind of AI generated sort of data mining might allow us to make things that are incredibly site responsive in that we're not doing yet, but I haven't got there yet. I'm still, I'm still too much of a control freak to let go of it yet. We'll see. Can I hook into that for a second, uh, Duncan? Um, your idea sounds a little bit like you are looking for something that is generative, as in where you set up uh, like a rule set, say, and um, the application uh, creates the experience based on interactions, but in a way that is not predefined. To an extent, but but I want to maintain a level of authorial control over that, um, which is a challenge. It's what my PhD is in at the moment, and that's just in pre-recorded audio and the tension between authorship and audience agency. So it'll, it might be a while before I, ha I, I dive in that direction. But yeah, that sort of realm. Yeah, I think I, I what I would like to see is, um, I mean, they have like scrolling apps out there, like I know deep time walk and it registers the motion of your uh, of your cell phone as like one step um, and it gives you you know audio entries every you know 100 meters or so um, and 
which is really great. Um, but I would like to see there be sort of an addition to that where you could be walking and um, not only, you know, I guess the one one option would be that it registers your uh, which direction you're going to be taking. And that could condition what part of the story you're getting. Right. So to really enhance this, like, uh, choose your own adventure type um, walking app, I guess. Um, I guess the other option would be is that, you know, you walk this linear line in real life, but what you're really doing is you're, you have an option, you come to these options, option A or option B on the app, and then you're able to choose which branch of the story that you want to, uh, that you want to take. Of being the storyteller, right? Having this, uh, you know, you have this one beginning, but you have countless varieties of endings that are possible. And I think it would keep the app really fresh too, because you could try different versions of the story as you're going through it. Um, anyway, that would sort of be like, you know, my dream project. David, I would say that that's, that's the core of what a locative app already is, because people's physical route is not confined. So it's actually one of my issues with it that because the different material is placed around, people can choose which route they take from it. And there's a lot of works that, I mean, fans work is more like that, that people choose their own routes to it and they create their own narratives to it that way. Um, I like to try and constrain them, but that's that the, the physical openness of, of it means that that does break it out from a linear, from a linear path or, already. Yeah, I think this would be more of like, um, like just a, I know it'd fall into the category of just like a strict like walking app. It wouldn't necessarily be um, like a site specific app in general. There are two um, Borges texts which um, this makes me think of. One is the Book of Sand, which is a <laughs> book. Uh, the, the fiction has this idea that it's a book with pages that are so fine. That there is an infinite number of them so however charmed you are by a story um, you're never going to be able to find it again because there's an infinite number of leaves um, and the other one is the obviously is the garden of the forking paths um, the choose your own adventure thing is um, I guess I'm not going to say tired but it's it's a very very familiar um, shape um, but a choose your own adventure forking paths with the world coming in, allowing allowing the the real world to to influence what's going on with all its vagaries and its and its um, specificity, so that you can never you know you can never recreate that path going through it because the world is different. That feels like a, a kind of richness. Yes, um, I'm a, yeah. I'm a huge Borges fan, so I would I would concur. But I mean, uh, I think um, I think we're at the beginning of this, and that it and that the potential of the medium for transformation of the individual is high, and therefore I I, I suppose part of what I'm kind of hoping is going to happen is that that spreading of the voice of who's doing this is is going to happen that we're, we're all going to be get get better at letting go <laughs> and um uh and and that that we begin to see a real mushrooming of the of of, of whose tell whose story and 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 what is the change that's being um what is the spectrum of change actually because it's not that any one piece is should necessarily be directed to a kind of narrow purpose but but given the power of the medium and and it, its potential to to expand into new communities and new voices and new people telling stories, then I, I, I would say that there's a really exciting transformational possibility in the in, in the future um, as as we get better at being able to put these tools into more people's hands. You know. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's a very positive uh, place to end. I would suggest. Um, uh, so I'd, I'd like to thank all the, the panelists uh, and um, and all the people who made it possible. So uh, Babek and Kurt and, and Andrew and uh, obviously our sponsors at Echoes um, and uh, and Julian for staying up to the wee small hours. 
Uh, a big thank you uh, to all the panelists who chipped in today and uh, gave their time and energy and uh, experience and told us so much because there's a, a huge amount of knowledge here and uh, it's really exciting to, uh, to to meet you all and see you face to face if that be the case because we've uh, many of us have encountered your work but we've no idea who you are so this is a rather uh, lovely way to find out a little bit more um, and, and most of all we have to thank Echoes who um, as I explained before is a, a geolocative app it's been mentioned a few times. Uh, it does have a fantastic free offer, which uh, allows you to uh, um, have a go straight away. So the answer is please do use the uh, Echoes app and uh, go visit their echoes.xyz. Uh, and um, thanks all very much for um, coming to this panel and for Nigel for putting it together.